But it is good to be here. I really appreciate this congregation, the stand they've taken for the truth over the years, and uh, the good fellowship that we can have with the brethren here. And uh, all the other speakers that have come from their various congregations, we're thankful for all of those congregations, the stand that they take for the truth, and the support that they give their preachers. And uh, certainly it is good that we have as many as we have left that will stand and, and hold to the old paths and hold other people to the old, old paths. It's unfortunate uh, that as we consider this lesson where Jesus says, I am the truth, that a lot of people could care less anymore. Even those that just a few years ago, within the last decade, would stand with us have compromised the truth and turned their back on it and no longer defend it the way they once did. Those that used to stand shoulder to shoulder with us are no longer our allies, but they have become our enemies. And it is sad for me to have to say that, but it's nonetheless true. If we're going to talk about the truth today, that's one truth that we have to own up to, we have to face. That there are less and less faithful congregations, less and less faithful brethren, less and less faithful gospel preachers, and less and less faithful elderships in the Lord's church today. And that is a sad situation. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that it may get worse before it gets better. Truly, God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. We can see it in our own generation. And so as we consider John chapter 14... Verses 5 through 11. We've, we've read these verses. We've, this will be the third lesson we've had on verse 6. Okay? So I'm just going to narrow our, our scripture reading down beginning in verse 5. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Now, having been a gospel preacher for about 30 years and dealt with many people in the church and out of the church, I can see and hear, or at least hear the frustration in Jesus' voice when he answers the next question. He comes along and, and after he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, then he says, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffice. Now, Jesus, can you imagine? I wish, I wish we could hear his voice as he answers this, this statement of Philip. Show us the Father. Jesus, have I been so long with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? We see this regular in the preaching of Jesus. How that he would teach and teach and teach, and then people would come along that had just heard what he said, and ask a ridiculous question. Show us the Father and it suffice. Well, I'm the Father. Have I been with you so long and you still not know me? Now here's somebody that had been with Jesus on a regular basis, day by day. Had heard many of the things that Jesus had said. And Jesus just spells it out for him. And he still doesn't get it. Jesus, the master teacher. Jesus who says, I am the truth. And yet, there were some that listened to the words of Jesus, that sat at His feet day by day for over three years, and still they were having trouble. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was fixing to ascend, and He talks to the uh, apostles for the last time, He says, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? So they still didn't get it. 
They still didn't get it. And we have people today that just don't get it and we scratch our head and wonder why. You have to want to know the truth. You have to be a diligent student of the Bible to know the truth. We need to be workmen that need not to be ashamed. Study to show thyself approved, Paul says to Timothy. Right? 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's how we come to a knowledge of the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. When Pilate was interrogating Jesus in John chapter 18, verse 36 to 38, Jesus says, that's the reason I came to, to bear record of the truth. That's why I came into the world. And Pilate's response, what is truth? What is truth? I don't believe he really wanted to know the answer to that question. I think he was just frustrated. He was trying to release Jesus. The, the people weren't cooperating. And in Pilate's mind, Jesus really wasn't cooperating either. So what is truth? What is truth? That's really a, that's really a cop out. That's just a way to, to not deal with the issue. And I believe that that same attitude exists today when people say that we can't really know the truth. Do you realize there's people that are adamant about that? And they would say, they wouldn't say it in these words, but basically what they're saying is, I know that we can't know anything. Can, not even, can we see the contradiction in that? It seems like the only thing we can know is that we can't know. And so we need to ask them a, a counter question and ask them, are you sure about that? You see? Then there are those people that say, okay, we can understand the Bible, but we can't understand it all alike. You know, there's been people, philosophers, struggling with this idea of what is truth and what is reality, going all the way back to Thales, who is supposed to be the father of philosophy. On down through Plato, Aristotle. I remember studying philosophy when I was at Southwest School of Bible Studies under the directorship of David Brown. Made us study philosophy, and it's a good thing. We need to know some of those things. And I remember one philosopher who said, his name was Heraclitus, lived about four or five hundred years before Christ. And his version of reality was that everything is in constant change. Everything is in constant change. And he took the position that you can't step in the same river twice. Now think about that for just a minute. You can't step in the same river twice. And his idea was, well, the water's flowing, there's erosion and things like that, and by the time you try to step into it the second time, it's a different river. But what does that say about the nature of reality? There's got to be something that lets me know that the Red River north of, in, at the north border of Texas is the Red River and not the Mississippi. And no matter how many times I step in it, it's still going to be the Red River. But that's how uh, crazy people are when they're trying to figure out the nature of reality. And then I remember studying further, and I, there's another guy who strongly disagreed with Heraclitus. And I said, oh, some reasons coming into the study. This guy, he agrees with me. This guy's wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And this guy says, yeah, Heraclitus is wrong. You really can't step into the same river once. <laughs> I'm like, really? And so, because by the time you pick up your foot to put it in the river, it's already changed before you get there. It's not the same river you started to step into. <laughs> and then there's Zeno. Don't ever read about Zeno before breakfast. <laughs> Zeno comes along 
And he's trying to dis- he's trying to prove that motion is impossible. He does. Okay, if you want to take a trip of 100 feet, okay, you draw a line out, it's 100 feet. Before you get to the 100 foot mark, you have to go halfway, right? Everybody would agree that. Before I get to the 100 foot, I have to go halfway. But before I get to halfway, I have to go half of that. And then I have to go half of that. And half of that, and by the time he gets done, he's convinced that you can't make the first step to get to that first half of a half of a half of a half. Somebody needs to kick him in the seat of the pants and he'll know that you can move. (laughs) And you know, that's what people believe. That people, these men, going all the way back to Thales, the father of, of modern philosophy, have influenced Western thought even unto this day. And that's why, that's why we have people that are confident that we really can't believe anything. I remember one philosopher, and this was the illustration that he used. He said, truth... It's like a wiener tied onto a stick hanging in front of a a dog. You tie the stick on the back of the dog and that dog's always trying to get to that wiener. But he never can quite get to it. And he said, that's the way truth is. Truth is out there. And you search for it and you look for it and you try to get it, try to find it, but you never can quite make it. It's always out there just beyond our grasp. Jesus forever answered the question, what is truth? I am truth, Jesus said. I am the truth. In answer to Philip's question, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. His primary response is, I am the way. I am the way. Right? Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. And without the life, there is no living. Jesus is the way to heaven, to a life eternal. The Bible, His Word, is the instruction so that we can know the way. And then our destination is eternal life. That's what He's saying there. That's what He's trying to get across. So that where He is, we can be also. But without the way, and without the truth, and without the life, all of which Jesus provides, we'll never get to heaven. We'll never get to heaven. We think about the word truth as we define it. The body, it's the body of real things, events, and facts, the body of true statements and propositions. The property of being in accord with fact or reality in accordance with fact. All true science, all true philosophy always leads back to God every time. And notice I said true science and true philosophy. Because God is the source of truth. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's why he can say he's the truth. Everything that is true is in harmony with the nature of God. You see, that's truth. The problem with people like Thales and Heraclitus and Zeno is they've taken God out of the picture and they're trying to find the nature of truth the nature of reality out of their own mind. That's what they do. They sit around and think this stuff up. 
never considering God. Now some of the early Greek philosophers considered God as the source of the universe, but they didn't think of Him as the God of the Bible. They would be considering God as maybe some eternal first cause. That's how Plato and Aristotle thought about God. But then some philosophers, and this does go back to Thales and his uh, disciple Anaximander, who followed him as the, the uh, director of the school of Miletus, they would talk about the Logos. The Logos. And they would say that the Logos was that power in the universe that created everything. They would say that that is the ultimate wisdom and the source of wisdom. So when we come to John chapter 1 and verse 1, it gives us a little insight into why John said in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. He's taking a philosophical term of his day and applying it to Jesus and saying he's that source. He's the authority. He's the power. He's the creator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things that were created was created through or by Him. And nothing that was made was made without Him. And then that Word became flesh. Verse 14. And we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Yeah, that's Jesus, the truth, the Word, the Logos. As John would say, before he was born of the virgin, he existed as the second person of the Godhead. We refer to him sometimes as the Son, sometimes as Jesus, sometimes as the Word, as John did. But he's always existed. He's always been there. He was there in the beginning. Brother Davidson talked about, let us make man in our image. That's the, that's the reference to the Godhead. That's the us there. Jesus was the active force in the creation. God spoke the world into, be, into being and He continues to sustain it through the power of His Word. And we've talked about that earlier this, this lectureship in other lessons. And then we come down after we talk about the idea of what the nature of truth is, what's in, in harmony with the nature of God. That's what truth is. Jesus is the embodiment of that truth. He's the, the physical representation, the personification of that truth. But what about truth as it applies to religion? we think about the definition of religion, it's a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. A cause, a principle, or set of beliefs held to with and or with, with and faith. With, with, with faith. We hold to it with faith. Now the difference between religion and truth is this. Religion can change. Truth never changes. What was true in the New Testament times over 2,000 years ago is still true today. It doesn't change over time. But religions come and go. Any set of beliefs, attitudes, or practices frequently and faithfully held can be described as religion. Truth and religion are not necessarily go hand in hand. I can be religious and not have the truth. 
Just because somebody is religious doesn't mean they have the truth. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 22, Paul says, when he was in Athens on Mars Hill before Areopagus, he said, I perceive that y'all are very religious. American or King James says superstitious, but the word is religious. You're very religious. They were religious, but they were neck deep in idolatry. They were religious without truth. Romans chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, What? My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal toward God, but not according to knowledge. See, they've rejected the truth, and then they've gone about, they've set, rejected the righteousness of God, and gone about to establish their own righteousness. See, they were religious, but they didn't have the truth. In John chapter 8 and verse 31, you can be religious and the truth. In fact, you can, the only true religion is based on the truth. In John chapter 8 and verse 31, Jesus makes mention of how to become his disciple. He says, you have to abide in my word. If you abide in my word, then you can be my disciple. Now a disciple is somebody that is trying to learn from the master, but that's not all. It's not just a student, not just somebody that's trying to learn. But this is a person that's trying to become like the master, to imitate the master. And Jesus says the first step in that process is to abide in my word. Now if you abide, he says, if you abide in my word, the very next verse says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, now understand this. We, we got to understand what Jesus is saying here. Number one, we can be his disciple. His disciple and only His disciple. And the only way we can be His disciple is if we abide in His Word or His teaching. And then He says we can know the truth. Now what does that say about all those philosophers we were laughing at a, a moment ago? That, that say, well, you know, the truth is out there. We just can't get to it. We're going to look for it the rest of our life. And the next generation is going to look for it. They're not going to have any better luck than we did. Jesus says we can know the truth. Now I'll tell you what. Just between me and you, I'll take Jesus' word over all the philosophers' word any time. Jesus says I can know the truth. Now that tells me, number one, if I can know the truth, then David can know the truth. He may have a little more trouble coming to the knowledge of the truth than me, or I may have a little more trouble coming to the knowledge of the truth than him. But the fact is, if we work at it diligently and properly, we can both come to a knowledge of the truth. He can come to it on his own. I can come to it on my own. And I'm not dependent on him. And he's not dependent on me to come to that truth. But once we understand the truth about something, we're going to be in agreement. That's the nature of truth. It's based in fact. It's based in reality. It's based on the evidence. And when I reason on the evidence and come to a proper conclusion, my understanding of the truth will be the same as David's. And anybody else that goes through that process will understand the truth just like us. And that gets us back to 1 John chapter 1. God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him, and we abide in darkness, we lie, and the truth is not in us. Do you understand that John just called his brethren liars? 
if they said they had fellowship with God and, ab and, and abided in darkness. He called them liars. It's ironic that when we stand up for the truth and we mark those people who teach error, that some would dare to stand up and call us liars. They got it backward. They have it backward. If we come to an understanding of the truth and we reach out and try to have somebody else come to understanding of the truth and they refuse, then they're the liars because they reject the truth. When we stand up for the truth, we are not liars. And we cannot be intimidated by those that would call us those kinds of things. Liars. Vile. Toxic. See, that's the way some people respond to the truth. Now, after all of that said, where are we? We still have the truth hasn't changed any. Right? The truth is still the truth and you either abide in it or you don't. But one thing is certain, if you don't abide in it, you don't have fellowship with God. And if you don't have fellowship with God, I can't have fellowship with you. Because my fellowship is based on the truth of God's Word. And my fellowship with God. I have to go through God before I can fellowship David or anybody else here. When I'm in fellowship with God and David's in fellowship with God, we're in fellowship with one another. If either one of us depart from the truth, fellowship with God is broken, and fellowship with one another is broken. And until that person is restored to the truth, with the truth, that fellowship cannot be extended. That's the nature of truth. The Bible says one thing, and I either believe it or I don't, if I reject the truth of God's Word, then I break fellowship with the Father. And when I break fellowship with the Father, I break fellowship with the faithful. And it is wrong for the faithful then to try to extend fellowship with me. That's 2 John, verses 9 through 11. We need to abide in the doctrine of Christ. In fact, John says, if we abide not in the doctrine of Christ, we have not God. If I reject the truth, I have to reject God too. I cannot say that I have fellowship with God but reject His truth because He's the source of it. It's a package deal. I have to accept the truth of God's Word in order to accept Him. And if I don't accept the truth of His Word, then what happens? He doesn't accept me. Matthew chapter 10 verse 32. Jesus said. Except you. Whosoever confesses me before men. Him will I confess before my father which is in heaven. When I accept the word of God. And live it in my life. I'm making that good confession. To everybody around me. Right. But if I. Do not confess him. If I do not accept his word. And I do not live it in my life. And I do not demonstrate it to those around me. Then he won't confess me before my Father which is in heaven. That's the nature of truth. That's the nature of truth. In everything we do in religion or in life. Remember, Peter said, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life and godliness. Life, that's our everyday living. That's our day-to-day -day life. That's when we're at home. That's when we're at work. That's where we're, we're citizens in, in the country. That's when we're, we're on vacation. Wherever we go doing our life, that's what it's talking about. But what about godliness? Well, that's our piety before God. That's talking about our religion, our faith. And so God has given us instruction on both of those things. 
so that we're without excuse on what we're supposed to do. The quotation behind me. We have to have authority. As David said, for everything we think, say, and do. That's what it means when it says it's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It just doesn't matter. The fact is that we can know God's will in every aspect of our life because He's revealed it to us in the truth of His Word. And so we can't stand in the judgment and, and have the defense, well, I didn't know better. You should have. You should have. Because He's done everything that's possible to get us to know better. He sent His Son to be that blessed example of how to live in this world. I appreciate so much what Brother Davidson did in the book of Mark and showing us the, the characteristics of the life of Christ through that book. That was an excellent point in his lesson. But that's what Jesus was. He was our example so that we can know the truth. But not only that, but he left us a record of the truth in the New Testament so that we can know what it is. That we can abide in it. That we can have fellowship not only with the Father but with the Son and with one another. Jesus is the truth. John 17 verse 17. Thy word is truth. Jesus said. Truth is revealed to us through his word and we need to preach it. John 3 and verse 16 through 17. Preach the word. Uh, or uh, the, the idea there is all scripture is given by inspiration. And it's profitable for doctrine, for, instru for, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished under every good work. It's good for doctrine to know what the church ought to teach, because what the church teaches matters. If we want to know the truth, we have to go to the Bible for reproof, for testing and proving that which is true, to identifying that which is wrong. For correction, providing information, we need to correct sin and error. For instruction in righteousness, only God has the authority to determine what's righteous. I remember when we were opposing the Dave Miller issue, and there were several people that were attacking us, not trying to make a defense, but just attacking. One of the things they said was that we were trying to destroy Several good works. I remember the number nine, I think. It was nine. We're trying to destroy nine good works. Only God can determine what is a good work. First off, the work has to be scriptural. Then it has to be funded scripturally. And then it's got to be supported by those that are in fellowship with God. And if it doesn't meet those criteria then it's not a good work. And it doesn't have a right to exist. Doesn't have a right to exist. In fact, if the works that they were talking about were being destroyed, it wasn't anything that we did, but they, by their actions, were destroying the very works that they loved and sought to defend. They destroyed their own works. In fact, what we were trying to do was salvage those works by getting them back to God's Word and being what they should have been. We think about the truth. The truth is knowable. The truth is doable. We can do the truth. God isn't ever going to ask us to do something that we, we can't do. He's not going to re require something of us that's bad. He's not going to withhold something from us that's good. God's not that way. God, in His Word, has provided everything for us to give us not only spiritual life here, but eternal life in heaven. That's what the truth of God's Word is really all about. That's what Jesus is all about. We need to make studying God's Word a priority. We need to make sure that we understand 
the message of the gospel. The truth about Jesus Christ. You know, in every account in the book of Acts of conversion, it always starts out with a message about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's either spelled out specifically, or it's implied in every account of conversion. The Ethiopian nobleman in Acts chapter 8 was reading Isaiah chapter 53. Philip began at that scripture and preached unto him Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 22, Peter and the eleven, when they stood up on the day of Pentecost, began by preaching Jesus. Paul's own conversion, he was taught about Jesus. Later in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, he said that he preached unto them the gospel that they received, wherein they stood, whereby they were saved. How that Jesus Christ died, was buried, raised the third day, according to the Scriptures. You see, that's the truth that we need to believe in order to be forgiven of our sins. Jesus said, except you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. John 8 and verse 24. Except you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. How many times... Have we seen people sit through invitation after invitation after invitation and never respond? See, they've been presented with the truth. And that's another thing about the truth. When it's presented to you, we have free will. And we can accept it or we can reject it. When we give the invitation, it's not my invitation. It's not David's invitation. It's not the Spring Church of Christ invitation. It's the Lord's invitation. I'm standing here in place of the Lord on His behalf pleading with anyone here that may have sin in their life that needs to obey His gospel to come forward during that invitation song repenting of your sins confessing your faith in Jesus Christ and to put your Lord on in baptism that's what the Lord asks not me I'm just the messenger and for those here that may have already done that that may be in Christ but have gone back into the world you know that happens sometimes temptation gets a hold of us and sometimes we give in to that temptation God's made provision for that and the truth of that is this that we need to repent of that sin. And we need to acknowledge that sin is as broad as the sin is known. If it's a private sin, you can repent of it in your heart. And you can ask Jesus or, or ask God through Jesus Christ to forgive you of that sin. And it's gone. If it's a public sin, you need to make public confession of that sin. We have that opportunity in just a moment. When we sing the invitation song, if there's anyone that is subject to the invitation, we invite you to come forward now as we sing.